Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Shadows, movie, thoughts. I quite like how the film bookends itself with, you know, we have the angry mob, we have Josette, for all intents and purposes, about to throw sort of off a cliff, and we have the, you know, the, the, the fall, which, you know, which turns one of them into a vampire, you know, at the beginning it is Barnabas becoming a vampire, well, I suppose it wasn't necessarily the fall that turned him into a vampire, but that is when we find out, and that, that is when he finds out. And, you know, then at the end it is Josette, and it is a sort of ambiguous, bittersweet ending. Because yes, he gets Josette, but now they are both vampires. He never wanted to be a vampire. It wasn't just the fact that he lost, you know, Josette, and that he was then forced to live forever, you know. He never actually wanted to be a vampire at all. He, you know, when asked, he always replies in the film that it is a curse. And now he has created, as we find out just before the end credits roll, two like him. You know, so it is, and, and again, you know, the film deals with the tragedy of in, inherent to a vamp vampiric character. You know, there there is no real, you know, sort of escape from it. And so, you know, is is it a good thing? Is it, you know, sure they, they may be together, but now twice as many people are going to die. You know, and yeah, it, so, so I, I quite like that. And, you know, we don't know, for the record, I don't think it was sequel baiting. I think it was just saying that, you know, I, I actually kind of figured that she would you know, turn back. We, we saw her with the teeth, just as he drains her. And I love the visual of that as well. With Again, not something I've seen in other movies. Someone being drained of blood, visualized by a bag of blood that is hooked up to them, being drained to the point where it you know, sort of shrinks in, you know, like, like a sort of vacuum. Just because That was really great. A great way to visualize it. Because, you know, how do you show? Well, now that person is drained of blood, you know. It, it's a and and it's a memorable visual, you know. But but yes, I, I see it as Burton showing us, reminding us, you know, th this is what yeah, he does. This is what he, I mean. She, after all, she is tied to a cinder block down there and deep underwater. I, don't, I suppose she could come up out of it, but I don't see a real you know. And, and it's also just that the, the curse goes on, and it really did strike deep. There, there is no coming back from being a vampire, I suppose you could say. On the... Yeah, actually, the, the, on, on the book ending, the mob, I, I realized why the mob was necessary at the end of the film. For the book ending purposes. And I realized why it was necessary for the mob to leave. It was showing that this time Angelique wasn't going to win, or at least she was not going to win without a fight. Because this Collins generation are fighters. They are not going to let her just take Barnabas again. You know, that, that was the old Collins family. This is the Michelle Pfeiffer generation. Man, I wish I could remember her character name. And... Yeah, so they they have to be there and they have to leave. Actually, for a little while, I was thinking this is gonna end like Edward Scissorhands, isn't it? But uh, yeah, don't worry, I'm not gonna spoil that movie for just you know. all you need. All you know now is that there is an angry mob near the end of that. <sighs> but 
I don't quite buy that, you know, the mob sees a vampire attacking the woman who headed the mob, and suddenly they're just all leaving because something was... To, you know, and even the thing that, like, I don't know, the, the, the Michelle Pfeiffer's lines, we know them to be true, the, the, us, the audience, but wouldn't the town have responded? What are you talking about? As far back as we remember, it's been Angelique. You know, I mean, one thing is in their generation, but also just for the last 200 years, as far as I understand, she, you know, Angelique has been fighting to get, you know, so, so really, as far back as they would remember, Michelle Pfeiffer might know better, but as far back as they would remember, it would kind of be Angelique who had that kind of thing, you know, but yeah. <laughs> so don't completely buy that, but now the uh, interesting visuals in the film that I haven't seen elsewhere. I like that she, Angelique, cracks like like a fine vase, like like I don't know, like like a um, fine china maybe. That, you know, th I'm not sure we ever see any blood on her. Except for maybe when she cries. Is she the one who cries blood? Something like that. And, you know, so when she... And, and also, you know, we see it slightly earlier on when, when he is kissing Josette, you know, out on the balcony. And she, you know, we, we see a little bit of it. And we hear the, you know, the, the crackling. And, uh, the, what's it, yeah. You know, we, we hear it, we hear her coming apart. And, you know, that is that kind of thing because she is, she is not quite human. She is a witch and she has not aged, apparently, physically, you know, visually. She, she does not appear to have aged. But she is not a vampire and so it has taken its toll on her, the, the time that has passed. And what it has done, as, as uh, the way I read it, is she has become fragile, like a priceless vase. You know, so when she is injured, when, when she is physically hurt, that is how it manifests itself. You know, and you also note that it doesn't happen during the sex scene, you know. And the sex scene itself also has some interesting visual. Also, other than just the entire, I mean, the entire scene, you know, with them throwing each other into walls and rolling from a wall to the ceiling and never falling off and all this stuff. I love these little touches. At one point, she has four arms. When a woman has four arms, the instinct, and maybe this is just like in the West, but something inside us screams, ungodly, you know, evil woman. And what are, what are these four arms doing? They are scratching a man on his back, you know, with passion. So she is, she is excited, you know, so it, it is, it is the sign of an evil woman, but it is, it is an evil woman excited, and, and suddenly it's a joke. You know, it's, it's, a, and, and it's a pretty unforgettable visual, you know, because again, I, I don't know, maybe they exist, but I haven't seen a movie that has something like that, at least not in such a, I don't know, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but just, it, it's done quite well. And, you know, the, the extended tongue that she has, again, it's, it's very, very snake-like, and you know, this is, is not the first movie to have a female character with a long tongue in an erotic manner. But again, it does have this kind of, it, it has the connotation of ooh, evil woman, snake tongue, you know, venomous evil woman. And again, you know, she's, she's licking up his chest. So again, it becomes sexual in nature. And you know, that's just quite clever. Now, other visuals. 
I was a little surprised that the explosion was like pink. I don't know. I, I saw that in the trailer as well. I, I don't know. It just looks a little weird to me. I don't know. Maybe there was some decision, some some meaning behind that, but I don't quite. Visuals. I like that in the climax, sort of the Collinwood itself is turned against, you know, especially Michelle Pfeiffer. Because it's not the first time we see the statues. In fact, the moment Barbus walks in, he draws attention to them and speaks of how delicately crafted they are. And when they suddenly come alive. This is not the first time we've seen statues come alive. You know, I'm, I'm not listing this as some of the, you know, visuals that we haven't seen before, but I can't think of many other films where it has such an impact that it comes alive, because it's not the first time we see the statues. We've seen them a ton of times over the course of the film. as just the backdrop. as just the inanimate objects that they are. The same with the you know, the old paintings, although those we haven't noticed as much. We knew that there were, you know, paintings in the estate, but the statues especially we've noticed. And suddenly there are these creepy living things. It, it harkens back to something like Beetlejuice, you know. It, he just has this sense, because they are truly creepy. You know, and it could easily, it could easily have been played for laughs. The rest of the film, you know, or the, the comedic aspects of the film show that he could, he would have had no problem turning it into comedy, and just plain comedy. It actually, and I'm pretty sure it's a Terminator 2 reference, when she's standing there with the shotgun and just shooting several times, and Angelique is just, you know, knocked back a little bit, and that whole thing, you know, that was quite good. Some of the stuff with Jackie Earl Haley, the caretaker, I don't know, it's not terribly important to me, the parts that weren't funny, but I do want to mention, I thought it was quite funny when Barnabas was hypnotizing him early on, and he was... He, he was so drunk that he kept falling asleep, and yeah, that that whole thing was yeah, that was quite funny. And then he had to w wake him up and you know, stuff like that. In that end conflict, in the in the climax, I also quite liked how the family sort of stood together. You know, it's it's one of the t few times where you know. <laughs> It's not that the caretaker isn't afraid of the of, of Angelique. At least I I would say he is. At least to some extent, it is the first time that he really puts up a fight against her. You know, he you know with, with the valet thing, he still lets her through. You know. Also, I love the visual of her like with the claws scratching down, like, you know, walls and stuff like that. That was also quite nice. Anyway, you know, but when he stands there with an axe, you know, saying, you're going to have to go through me first, you know, again, the family has come together. You know, they are, they are no longer this disjointed group of people who just happen to be... <laughs> I love the line, I don't remember the father's name, but David's father, when, you know, we have to have a ball. Balls are important, you know, they are a way to show your power. Yes, that's exactly right. I've always been saying that this family needs more balls. That was fantastic. Anyway, the family has come together, you know, we have, you know, Pfeiffer standing there with a the shotgun. You know, and and you know, finally, David. You know, with the, I, I love the the bit also because it's just you know he's actually he's actually defying her, and the, you know what are you gonna do to me? It's not me, it's my mom, and the the ghost just comes and attacks with the chandelier, and it's it is that great thing because 
each time, you know, the other times we've seen the the ghost, there has been that. Or actually, that might have been just Seth's ghost. I don't remember exactly. But anyway, you know, we yeah, we have that, you know, with the chandelier, and so she finally does use. And I like that. That alone does not kill the yeah the the witch Angelique. Barnabas walks up to her, and here we get some you know a, a good fantasy element with her you know passing the heart to him and or trying to and it and he doesn't accept it and it crumbles in her hand and she passes you know that was a really great you know kind of and and the bit about you know, how he says you can't love that is your curse you want you didn't love me you wanted to own me you know because it is it is jealous rage you know i mean it is cliche, but if you love someone, if you love something, set it free, you know, and yeah, she, she wanted him to herself, even if he didn't want her back, you know, if, if he didn't love her back and didn't want to be with her. I quite like the, uh, the Chloe Moritz, something like that, with the you know, the, the dancing and yeah, you know, they're they're like eating dinner or something, and she's just dancing, and you know it's, she, because she's a teenage girl and it's the seventies, yeah, you know she's gonna be rebellious and just dance at that point, you know, and that. That whole, you know, and they could have made that, like, really silly or, you know, unbelievable, you know, to, to like, over-exaggerate. But it was just funny the way it was, you know. I I quite like, you know, I, th I thought pretty much everything Barnabas, almost every joke with Barnabas really worked. Some of my favorites were the, you know, the, the letter of the beast. You know, Mephistopheles, reveal yourself. And it's the McDonald's M. You know, I wonder if they, if they're quite happy with that product placement. You know, and that's, that's a Tim Burton joke. I, I can't think of that many Hollywood directors, that, that many directors who would just have their lead character yelling, you know, you are Satan at a huge corporate logo, you know, I just, yeah. I mean, I don't know if he means it or not, I just, I love that he actually, again, balls, you know. <laughs> and the, and, and it, when Barnabas wakes up from, you know, he's, he's in the coffin again, and he's like, oh, how long has it been? It's been about 20 minutes, Barnabas. <laughs> Now, what else was there? <laughs> I thought it was a little weird how apparently the people she works with, or at least one of them, know that she's a witch. Because there's that guy who's driving the car. You know, they've just locked up Barnabas in the coffin, you know. I, li I like the visual of her breaking his stick because it's just it's it's a symbol of him and it is just kind of because every time we see him he has the stick and suddenly and it, it just tells you you know it just got real you know this is yeah and yeah so yeah she's just sitting there in the car in the in the passenger seat and she calls down this curse so the fire will start and the driver's just waiting for her to finish the curse. The moment she stops speaking, he drives off. And he's not like, so boss, what was that all about? Just, you know, that's... Uh, so I guess at least he knows that she's a witch. Or, yeah. Now... I feel that Josette got a little bit forgotten in the climax. I... It, it was a good call to have it be after the big climactic battle between Angelique and Barnabas. 
but I feel it would have been more effective if it hadn't been established that she was basically going to die the same way her ancestor did her. You know, she's like the reincarnated version, or whatever. If, th that was established before the big fight, so all the time he's fighting her, I mean, I literally forgot about her character, and suddenly it's like, oh right, she's there too, you know, it's not like I didn't, I wanted to see them together, you know, I, I really got invested in that love story, but then suddenly it just has this completely different, because it didn't ever cut to her walking towards it, what I think they should have done was not bring it up for a while in the film, and then just have it be, you know, right after the fight, just as she passes the heart or something, her dying words be, at least Josette, at least you can't save Josette in time, you know, yeah, her name for that, period, whatever. I suppose I could talk a little about uh, her backstory. I liked that it was sort of revealed, there, there are hints, you know, she, I mean, the first time we see her, we realize that she's lying, you know, because the first thing to come out of her mouth is her trying out a name, or, or maybe she's using her real name, I don't remember what the first name she says is, but she looks at a poster and then she's like, that's a better name, I'll use that, and she says that, and so immediately we know that she's not who she says she is, and for a while that kind of, you know, nothing happens from that, and then we see her sort of have this nightmare flashback memory thing that explains, you know, she saw ghosts, but her parents thought that she was insane, so yeah, you know, and that's why she said to David, you know, some people are just more perceptive to that sort of thing, and Michelle Pfeiffer doesn't believe in myths, so she just says, you know, she, she tells her, don't say that, you know, stop, you know, you can work for us, but I will not have that in my house. And, yeah, you know, so she, she has that, and as we learn, it was her ancestor who was, you know, it was Josette who was guiding her, you know, from childhood. And Josette guided her to Barnabas, you know, and so she felt, you know, like she said, she was hypnotized, she felt drawn to him. You know, and again, you have that sort of the ghost with the un, unresolved issues. That's also, that's how I read it. That's why the ghost of David's mother is powerful enough to kill or greatly injure Angelique, you know, with the, with the light uh, thing, you know, because of all that built up anger, because it was an unfair death. She had done nothing to deserve Angelique's wrath. And so she had all that power to help defeat her, you know. Now, I gotta talk a little bit about Chloe Moretz's secret. You know, pretty much everyone in the family has at least one secret. Chloe Moretz turns out to be a werewolf. for no real reason. It, it doesn't add anything to the film. It's not that she defeats Angelique. She, she fights her for a little bit, but that's kind of it, and it's just... I don't know, I, I suppose it's supposed to be like... I was... I'm choose. It's... Like, you know, she, she's always been locked in her room and all that. I, I don't know, I guess when she transforms into the werewolf. She's in her own room and nobody expects her to come out anyway because but she would only transform at night and only like, you know, once every few months at the you know what's it called? Moon full moon kind of thing. So it wouldn't really matter. I, I don't know, it just it doesn't really feel like it adds anything. It's just I don't know, I, I Maybe Burton just went through like a magazine of different, you know, gothic horror movie monsters and was like, oh, hey, werewolf, haven't done that one yet. I could put one in this. I don't know, maybe there were werewolves in the original show. Maybe he saw that that's what the kids care about these days. I don't know. If needed a love triangle then. <laughs> well, it needed for the werewolf to be involved in the love triangle, but whoa, that's just 
nasty because Barnabas is related to her and she's underage. Anywho, I did like the secret with the psychiatrist. Yeah, you know, I, I just love her character in general. How she's always drinking, and how you know when she's in her own office, you know, and, and, and talking with Barnabas, she's just, you know, we see her put a pill in her hand and in her mouth, and then bottle, yeah, you know, not bottle, but you know, glass of scotch, you know, brilliant, just yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, and and then she. You know, she's, she's like talking about how, you know, and, and that it's, it's established. She wishes she was young again. You know, she doesn't feel attractive anymore. I don't know, maybe Burton isn't paying her enough attention. And so it, you know, we, we could, we should have been able to figure out, I suppose, that she was going to try to trick him and turn herself into a vampire. But yeah, you know, it's, it's nicely done, I'd say. And I like how that sort of, you know, again, highlights, you know, every, every so often in the film, it brings back up the point that Barnabas is not entirely a good guy. You know, he, he may not be his own fault that he's a vampire, but he is a vampire. And that is, you know, he, he, he has taken the consequence of that, and the film takes the consequence of that, of having a lead character who is a vampire. You know, there's no BS about, oh, I'm the good kind of vampire, you know, I only kill, you know, these animals, or I only, you know, no, he is a vampire. You know, I love the hippie scene, you know, with the, I mean, from the start of the scene, you know, at some point that, that doobie is going to get to Barnabas's hand, and still, you crack up the moment you see that hand with the nails, and, you know, and he just passes it like it's toxic or something and and the scene ends with you know, I'm afraid I'm going to have to kill all of you and I'm very sorry for that yeah it's just yeah and I love just the whole thing with money or sheep the, the there are like I don't know, four or five lines devoted to that little bit and it just keeps being funny you know, it's it it doesn't feel repetitive. It's just kind of building the joke. You know, when when we get the response from one of the hippie girls, women don't care about money, man, or sheep. You know, you just you you lose it at that point. And I, I just I love the I, I got I love the bit with you know Barnabas is just walking up. It's been 200 years, you know, he kills all these people. I love how chaotic that scene is as well. You really feel their te terror, you know. It's just this, what is even killing us? I, th I guess he's using the hooks and the chains to drag some of them in, it seems. But anyway, you know, when, when he finally gets to one of them, you know, he like, grabs him. I'm dreadfully sorry, but you must understand, I'm terribly thirsty. And, you know, just... Yeah, he's a vampire, he's been there for 200 years, I guess he is thirsty, you know, he's just, so that was, that was really good, and yeah, again, you know, you have that, and, and he even says it at one point, I think he says to the psychiatrist, Madam, I'm neither gentle nor good. I suppose that more or less covers it. I, I really liked how he really tried to, you know, improve the family and really, you know, I mean, he, he's, you know, straight, you know, straight with the, the guy, you know, the David's father. And that he says, I'm going to do something repulsive. I'm going to give you a choice, you know, and he, you know, literally says, you're going to be the father that that kid wants and deserves, or you are out of here. And, you know, he just, he, he can't live up to that, you know, and so he just leaves, you know, and, and just, I, I really respect how the film, you know, it doesn't 
say that everything is going to work out just fine, but it is, you know, he, he's, you know, he's, he's weeding out the garden. He is pulling off the band-aids that have been, you know, left in place, you know, af even after. It was obvious that he was not a good father right from the start, you know. So he, after a while, he's, he's given the chance, and he just, he can't live up to that, and so he just has to go. And David is going to have to find another father figure, and, you know, they're, they're going to have to make it, like Michelle Pfeiffer, the last line she says, you know, we're going to live... We're gonna live through it and fight through it. I think this line, you know, it just, you know, it's it's not gonna be easy because that's that's not what reality is. But you do need to face reality. You do need to say this is not working out and it's not going to work out. So I have to uproot and I have to go somewhere else and find a way to make it work. You know. And I really like how the film deals with the class struggle, you know, that I, I think it does a good job also of not making it feel, I mean, basically we are rooting for the upper class, you know, the, the upper classmen in the film. You know, it, it could easily have been framed the other way. It could have been the witch who was, you know, the, the, the lower classmen at least, who were the good guys. But really, it is about, you know, the, yeah, you know, they, they, they built it and they, you know, and I also feel like it, I suppose maybe so that we, we don't lose sympathy for the upperclassmen. I don't feel like, at least that it was because of his class or his stature that he dumped Angelique. I feel it was the the emotion. You know, he, at that point, he loved, you know, Josette. So, like he said, it would have been a lie. You know, he he might have cared for her. He may have even loved her, but it, she wasn't the one true love. You know, he might have had a certain amount of love for her. Excuse me, and she blames that on his class because she's always been treated as lower class, you know, to him and by him, or not maybe not by him. We don't know that about that, but you know, it's been drilled into her head. We we see you know by her mother that she is a lower class than that, you know. I suppose that. Pretty well covers it. I like that the film, you know, near the end, the family finds out, well, everyone but Michelle Pfeiffer of the family finds out, you know, she already knew, that Barnabas is a vampire. And at first, they do you know, distance themselves from him, literally. And then at the end, they do still come together and accept him and, yeah, you know, fight for the family. You know, I, th I thought that was a really good, you know, yeah, just in general, the, the, the whole family theme works really well in the film. You know, because that is also, I mean, th there's a stark contrast between the, the family unit, the, the more or less healthy family unit that... Barnabas manages to assemble out of these, you know, mere blood relatives, and the 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 lonely, the the one person of Angelique, you know, who she doesn't care about the family. She, you know, she only cares about Barnabas. She only wanted to destroy the family because Barnabas was part of the family, and because the family was important to him. You know, otherwise she wouldn't have even cared. And that is also part of, you know, the key to her demise. It is that, you know, that, that jealousy. Maybe even if they had been together and he had cared about his family as well, she might have been furious about that. You know, it, it, is, it is her character. She is, she is a selfish person. And, 
you know, that, that does eventually lead to her downfall. You know, and I quite liked also how the, the, the sort of implication that you know, for 200 years, you know, every so often she becomes her own child or a cousin or something, you know, just to make sure that she can continue to run the business without anyone asking questions, you know. I suppose that more or less covers it. I, I really like the opening, you know, before the opening credits, we have just these scenes with you know, Johnny Depp doing voiceover, and yeah, these, these scenes that show the backstory of Barnabas, where we really get a sense of just, yeah, the, the tragedy of his life and the, the whole, the Collins family curse is set up qu quite nicely. You know, and I don't know. I don't know if it was like intentional. I can imagine that the trailer was made after the film, and it was just how you know, marketing people figured it was best to market the movie. But I feel like the opening sequence, whether people came in expecting comedy or not, it really established this is not just going to be funny. You know, this is a tragic movie, also. You know, and I again testament to Burton's talent. You care. You've just met these people, but you care about Angelique's scorn and, or the scorn of Angelique, whatever. Figure out the grammar for yourself. I'm not a native English speaker. The, the loss of, you know, the, both his love, his, you know, both his love, his parents, and his humanity, the death of Josette, and all these things, you, you care, you know. And and also just the, you know, the, the and then with the ending, with the, you know, she, she does jump, because he's not gonna bite her, and she, she can't grow old and die from him while he never ages, you know, she just can't. Yeah, Burton, stop watching Twilight and don't try to copy it. Don't, don't, don't bellify, just said. Anyway. Yeah, so, so, yeah, we have, you know, and, and he bites her and it's, it's sort of the, the desperate last act and, and that is really, that is a part of Barnabas' character. He doesn't always make the right decision, but he makes it... I don't know, for, for the right reason, I suppose you could say. He just, he does truly care. He, he loves Josette and Victoria. And he can't bear to lose her again. And so he... Yeah, he, you know, he, I mean, he also shouldn't have scorned... Uh, you know, well, I guess he didn't know that Angelique was a witch, but he shouldn't have scorned her. Anyway, you know, it, I mean, you know, him, him walking out of her office, him even going into her office like that, a little unprotected, that last time, you know, it was a foolish decision, as it turns out, you know. So the whole thing, yeah, I suppose that pretty well covers it. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.